So in this video, we're going to learn about the actual structures that you find within cells, eukaryotic cells. These are called the organelles. Now we're going to look at what we call a general animal cell and a general plant cell. Now these cells don't really exist like this um, because most animal and plant cells are specialized to carry out a particular function. But this just shows the general structures that you'd expect to find inside both these types of cells. We're interested in what we call the ultrastructure. These are structures which can only be seen with the electron microscope. So the first and probably most important organelle is the nucleus. It's the largest organelle. It's surrounded by a double membrane, which is called the nuclear envelope. But this nuclear envelope has little pores in it, which are very important when it comes to the process of protein synthesis, which we will be looking at later on. Now the nucleus contains all the DNA of the cell. Uh, which is normally in this form of chromatin. It's unraveled and jumbled up. Uh, before the cell is going to divide, the chromatin organizes itself more coherently into chromosomes. The nucleus also contains something inside it called the nucleolus. Uh, it's a dense, darker area within the nucleus, and its function is to produce ribosomes and RNA, both of which will be talked about later on. Cells can actually have more than one nucleolus. The next organelle we're going to look at is called the endoplasmic reticulum. Now there are two types of endoplasmic reticulum, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, or RER, and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, or SER. Now endoplasmic reticulum is made up of these flattened sacs of membrane, which are called cisternae. The rough ER also has ribosomes on the outside, dotted around, um, which are used for protein synthesis. Once a protein has been made on the attached ribosome, then that piece of membrane can pinch off, uh, form a vesicle, and will be transported to another organelle called the Golgi apparatus for processing, which we'll look at later on. The rough ER is usually found next to the nucleus of a cell and is actually sometimes joined to the actual nuclear envelope itself. The function of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is to manufacture lipids and steroids, such as hormones. It has the same structure as rough ER, but it doesn't have any of those dotted ribosomes on its membrane. So what are ribosomes? Well, ribosomes are made of ribosomal RNA and protein. They are used in the process of protein synthesis, which is one of the most important functions a cell has, is to make proteins. What the ribosomes do is they can read the genetic code and assemble the polypeptides which are going to make the proteins. The ones that we've got in eukaryotic cells are called ATS ribosomes. They're made up of two smaller subunits. One is a 60S subunit and one is a 40S subunit. Ribosomes can be found in two locations in eukaryotic cell. As we've just heard about, they can be found dotted along the rough endoplasmic reticulum or they can be found just floating around inside the cytoplasm. Now you may be wondering what's going on with these subunit numbers. Why does a 40S subunit and a 60S subunit um, make an 80S ribosome? Those numbers don't add up. Well, the S actually stands for Svedberg units, and it's actually a measure of how fast they move in a centrifuge. A centrifuge is a piece of apparatus that spins molecules around really, really, really quickly and measures their properties. Now the rate of sedimentation, which is what it's measuring really, is related in a complex way to the mass and shape of the molecule. And so when the subunits are combined, they have different properties. All eukaryotic cells have 80S ribosomes, and these are larger than the 70S ribosomes that are found in prokaryotic cells. However, there is a very strange thing, which is that if you look at the organelles, mitochondria and chloroplasts, they actually have their own ribosomes. And even stranger than that, they are 70S ribosomes, the same type as prokaryotic cells. Now, that is all to do with something called the endosymbiotic theory, which will be discussed more in section 2.1. Now, the next organelle is the Golgi apparatus. Once a cell has made a protein on the rough ER, then it will go to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus has this structure of flattened membrane sacs, um, all sort of piled on top of each other, a bit like a sort of pile of pitta breads. 
Now, uh, it will receive little vesicles from parts of the cell like the raffia. Uh, the vesicles will fuse with the Golgi. The proteins inside will be modified. There will, little bits will be added to them. Carbohydrates and other molecules will be added onto the proteins. Maybe some extra folding will be done. And so the protein is, has the exact structure it needs to carry out its function. And then it will go off the other side of the Golgi into a new vesicle, which can then uh, fuse with the plasma membrane and can be released via exocytosis, or it can be used within the cell itself. Lysosomes are dark spherical organelles found inside the cytoplasm. They contain hydrolytic enzymes from vesicles formed by the Golgi apparatus. The lysosomes are used for breaking down substances that the cell has taken in during phagocytosis. Or in some cells, uh, they can fuse with the cell membrane and release the enzymes out of the cell via exocytosis. In plant cells, actually, the vacuoles and the main vacuole can carry out a lot of these lysosomal functions. Also found inside all eukaryotic cells are things called proteasomes, which are protein complexes. They are found in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm of cells, and their function is to degrade unneeded or damaged proteins via proteolysis, a chemical reaction that's going to break down the individual peptide bonds between the amino acids. These proteins have been made by the cell, uh, what we call endogenous proteins, and maybe have been misfolded um, or in too, are in too high a concentration, so the cell needs to break them down. Proteins are tagged for degradation with a small protein called ubiquitin. The proteasome has been highly conserved during eukaryotic evolution. We can look back over a very, very old cells and still find these same uh, proteasomes. Mitochondria are a very, very important organelle. They are like the batteries that power the cell. The cell needs something called ATP to carry out lots of its metabolic processes. There, it is the energy for the cell. And mitochondria is where the majority of this ATP is produced in cellular aerobic respiration. Cells that need more ATP are gonna have more of these mitochondria. They are capsule shaped or spherical shaped and they have a double membrane. Um, they are a double membrane organelle. They are filled inside the inner membrane with a fluid called the matrix. And the inner membrane is folded, highly folded uh, into cristae to provide a large surface area. It has enzymes embedded in it called the ATP synthase enzymes, which are very important in the manufacture of ATP. As already mentioned, it has its own ribosomes, which are 70S, but it also has a very small amount of DNA called mitochondrial DNA inside it as well. Another very important organelle, but this time only found in plants, are the chloroplasts. Now this is where photosynthesis takes place. Chloroplasts contain the chlorophyll, which is the green pigment needed for photosynthesis. They are double membrane uh, organelles again and the inner membrane again is very highly folded. This time it's folded into things called thylakoids, which are actually stacked up into individual granum. This provides, again, a very large surface area for chemical reactions of photosynthesis to occur. They are linked, these grana, uh, via little lamellae, and the fluid that fills the whole of the inner membrane of the chloroplast is called the stroma. Animal cells sometimes have a small temporary vacuole, but plant cells have a large permanent vacuole. In plant cells, it's filled with something called cell sap, which is dissolved substances and water. And it's used to help maintain the cell shape, to keep the cell turgid, but it's also a site of storage for the plant cell. It's surrounded by its own membrane called the tonoplast. Plant cells have a cell wall, which gives the, uh, the cell its shape, keeps it a regular shape, and it provides strength and support for the cell. The cell wall is completely freely permeable. It doesn't control at all what comes in or what goes out of the cell. That is down to the cell membrane. It's made up of a few layers, the middle lamella, which contains pectin, and then lots of cellulose microfibrils, which is very, very strong. Plant cells can be linked together by little gaps in the cell wall, so their cytoplasm is actually linked, called plasmodesmata. Animal cells have inside them some things called centrioles. Um, they're not found in plant cells, although there are things called microtubule organizing centers in plant cells, which carry out the same job. Now, they're normally found in a pair right next to the nucleus, and they're arranged at right angles from each other. Each one of them is a bundle of nine microtubules 
and they are used in the process of cell division. What they do is they move to opposite ends of the cell and they produce something called the microtubule spindle, which is going to be used to move chromosomes and pull chromosomes apart in the process uh, of cell division. Cells also have something called a cytoskeleton. Now this is a fibrous network that fills the cytoplasm. It gives the cell a bit of structure and a bit of shape, but it also um, moves organelles around and controls um, a lot of the movement of vesicles within the cell. Uh, the cytoskeleton is made up of microtubules and protein microfilaments like actin. Eukaryotic cells also have cilia and flagella. Now cilia and flagella have the same structure. Typically cells possess one or two long flagella, whereas ciliated cells have many, many short cilia. The structure of cilia and flagella is that they are a bundle of nine fused pairs of microtubule doublets surrounding two single microtubules in the middle. They have different ways of beating. The flagella work more like a propeller-like motion, whereas the cilia beat backwards and forwards. They both need ATP in order to do this, and they are usually used for cell locomotion, like in the case of a sperm or a paramecium, or um, in cilia especially, they are used for wafting things like the mucus through the respiratory tract. You need to be familiar with micrographs. Here's a micrograph which shows a uh, Golgi apparatus there. You can see all the flattened membrane sacs and the se secretory vesicles coming in and out of either side of the Golgi. This is a micrograph of another eukaryotic cell. We can see various structures here. We can see the nucleus. We can see various uh, that it has more than one nucleolus. It's got a nuclear envelope, which we can see. There's huge quantities of rough ER used for protein synthesis. And also we can see mitochondria. Now the mitochondria are not all the same shape because remember this is just a section of a cell. So it might cut the mitochondria at a different plane or maybe the mitochondria is growing or dividing. So you're not always going to get perfect images of these organelles when you actually look at them through a microscope.